So the first thing I want to talk about, because I've never asked you this, but I was doing my research last night and I didn't understand how how critical you were in Warner Brothers getting the rights to Harry Potter. So let's talk about this for a second. Okay. Um, what was it about that that said, oh, we should get this? You know what I mean? It was a great book. Uh, we read it in galleys. We did, it had not been published. So it was not... Uh, I think while we were negotiating, it was released in England and it started becoming a phenomenon. It was just a great story. And it was like, it just felt fresh. And it just felt, you know, it caught my imagination more than anything else. Uh, and then I met JK and she laid out seven books, like where it was going. It was just like, wow, okay, we don't have to do much, you know, <laughs> like it's been figured out. Uh, we just have to now figure out how to reduce it to a two hour kind of experience, you know, um, it was not a kind, you know, it was interesting because at the time, uh, some of my boss's re reaction was, why are you buying a kid book for a lot of money? And I'm like, it's not a kid book. It's an everybody book. It's, it's got a great imagination. That's what drew, drew you know, that's what drew me to it. Yeah. I, I mean, obviously it turned out well. Yes. Um, do you think that is of the because you were involved in a lot of stuff at Warner Brothers, mm -hmm. Matrix? I can give you a laundry list of stuff you were involved yeah. with. Do you think the Harry Potter thing was the biggest thing of your career in terms of figuring out, identifying something like before anyone else realized what it was? Uh, that and the Matrix. I think Matrix was harder in many respects because it just doesn't resemble storytelling that was being going on. So at least with Potter, it was, a, you know, you go to a school, you have teachers. There was a lot of familiar aspects to it. So those two in very different ways, you know, obviously financially, Potter was an incredible thing. And thankfully, they really managed it really well. Um and, you know, each movie I thought was really good. And, and that's not easy to do. But she gave the blueprint. Matrix was harder because the blueprint was being figured out. Sure. Uh, you obviously along the way have tried to make movies that have not come together for whatever reason. If you could get the financing to make anything you want, what is that project that you've been trying to push up that hill that you couldn't have somehow hasn't been made? Wow. There's two, probably too many to pick one that... Uh, uh, I got to think about that because that, that's what's the one that got away. You can come back to it. Yeah, if you let's want. come back to it. Let me think about it because it's a good question. And I, I just to narrow it down to one, they're all my babies, you know? So it's like, sure. Yeah. Um, with this movie, um, how, when did you guys, after Bumblebee, I know you were developing two different things after Bumblebee, or so I heard. Mm -hmm. How did you guys figure out that this was going to be the sequel rather than like a Bumblebee sequel or, and maybe rather than something else? Mm -hmm. Well, what was interesting about the experience of Bumblebee, and it really influenced this movie a lot, was the intimacy that we were able to create emotionally, the audience clearly loved, but they were missing the spectacle. And so what we decided to do with this movie was take that intimacy and put it back into a spectacle. So that's what it ended up being, you know, and also you do, Bumblebee can't talk. So it does create some limitations on how you could tell a story. And we were trying to find something that both had character arcs for our humans, but also for robot. And, um, I think that's one of the really satisfying things if you're a fan of the franchise or if you're not is seeing Optimus Prime struggle with what he believes in, you know, and that experience of watching his character arc and Anthony's character arc collide. It's like that collide thing. You know, and <laughs> there you go, right for you. Um, you know, I think that is the spine of the movie. Sure. We, you've now made a number of Transformers films. Which one do you think went through the most changes in the editing room uh, and why? Well, Michael's movies always go through a lot of, a lot of metamorphosis because Michael likes to juggle so many things. So trying to put it all together uh, can be. But emotionally, probably this movie changed the most in the sense of how to um, accentuate 
the character arcs against the spectacle, which was our objective. But that's a, that is a nuanced thing to go through. So it takes a long time from an editor, editing point of view of like, do we have the right balance? Are we, do we not have enough motion? Do we have too much action? What is, the, what is that? So I wouldn't say that the story itself fundamentally changed, but I think the balance of it changed all the way through it. Did you end up with a lot of deleted scenes in this one? I never remember. Yes, there's a few. Uh, actually, there's quite a few now that I think about it. Um, yes, we did because we were hell bent on keeping the narrative focused on the emotional arcs going on. And so even though there was some really great fun stuff that we had that we cut, but we also wanted it to be under two hours. That was an objective. So, so yeah, some, some things got sacrificed along the way. Obviously, every time a Transformer is on screen, it costs real money. So how does it actually work in terms of figuring out the budget in terms of like, okay, we can get 45 minutes of Transformers footage in, in the movie and because of costs. Do you, like how does that get figured out? Or is it sort of just like, um, you know, like let's just do the movie and then we'll figure like, can you take me through yeah. like that pro the producer hat, if you will? I think the hardest part of for a studio actually is to be flexible about this because the idea that you can plan out what a battle scene is going to be. You know, we do, we budget, we have a guesstimate. Then you go shoot a scene in a crater and you realize it's really big. And how do you keep the world alive during, through the process, you know? And so the studio has to have a trust in the filmmakers to a certain extent that, that in other movies they don't have to have because we're operating in a blank space and like, how are we approaching it? You know, because all right, in our minds, is there 16 Transformers in that shot or two? Um, and so really, it's a process that you go through. You do your best guesstimate, but it always changes. But what we've found is some areas get more expensive and some areas get less. And then you always run into that moment where, okay, you've run out of, you know, now we know what's in here. What do we have to sacrifice to stay within the budget? If you have Optimus in a shot and then you add say three other Transformers, how much does that amplify the VFX budget of that shot? And how much is it sort of like, you know what I mean? Like, does it matter if you have five robots in yes. the frame? Yes, it does. The, the, the thing that people, you're adding complexity. When you add complexity, you're adding cost. So the ultimate battle scene here where you have all those things going on is really expensive. Um, and it, it's, it's, what I've learned over time is there's a way to do it where you project yourself thinking about, all right, how many do I need in this shot? And the longer the scale, the more expensive. So it helps storytelling sometimes to stay localized on it. You know, the, the battle on the bridge. Um, you're not seeing everything, but you're kind of peeking it. But if you try to do all that, then you're going to get out of it. So it's, it's really fundamentally a filmmaker point of view about, okay, what is the key element of the stories that I'm trying to keep alive in this shot? And can I eliminate the things around you? We spoke uh, recently, a little while ago, about the Transformers 1, which is the um, uh, ILM animated, mm -hmm. yep. can't wait for this thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's been like a month or two since I last spoke. Uh, any developments? How is it looking? When will people see footage? Yeah, well, I don't, th I don't know about when we'll see it. It'll be a while. Um, I'm, I can't tell you how excited I'm getting about it. I, it's one of those things that like, it just keeps progressing in the right direction. You know, you never know. Sometimes when you're making a movie, you're, you're like, well, I think it's working. Everything I'm seeing is working and it's exceeding my sense of what it was going to be. So I'm really excited about it. it. It is a very fresh and different look. I would say different than any animated movie you've seen. So, which is a high bar to set, but ILM is capable of delivering it, but also it's the imagination of our artists and our director. Um, and, you know, one of the great things is as you actually put the voices to the characters, you know, when we first listened to Chris Hemsworth's voice, you're like, God, is he going to be a good optimist? You know, he start obviously he starts as Orion Pax and you don't become optimist for a while. Um, so he's not playing for most of the movie, what we think of as Optimus Peter Cullen. 
Um, so it's that transition that, that and Chris's voice has a timber that it, it, remi- it, it, it it's logical that he, you know, that Peter Cullen would take over that voice, if you would, which is really great for the fans are going to really feel great. But Scarlet is amazing. And it's just coming alive in a way that um, it's really rewarding. And, I, and it just we had confidence in our director and all he's doing is giving us more and more. 